Greetings, this is Greg. In part one of this series, we learned that the FW-190's designer, Kurt Tank, had a background as a soldier in the First World War. He was educated as an electrical engineer and worked with other aircraft designers before working at Focke Wolf. His experiences in the First World War led him to prioritize ruggedness and ease of operation over pure performance. Kurt Tank felt that many fighters were analogous to a racehorse, fast but requiring a lot of care and near-optimal conditions to perform. He wanted the 190 to be more like a warhorse, rugged, reliable, and able to perform in most any conditions. In the previous episode, I said that the 190, although highly effective, had performance that was generally mediocre. Now, in hindsight, mediocre wasn't really the right word. It has negative connotations I didn't really intend. A better way to put it is to say that the 190's all-around performance was generally average as compared to its contemporaries. Of course, that varies a bit with time. Early in its career, as compared with other fighters, its performance was superior in most ways, but inferior in some others. For example, when introduced, it was faster than Spitfires and Yaks, but had inferior turn performance. As the war progressed, it lost its speed advantage at certain altitudes, but the turn performance gap closed up a bit as the newer, faster Allied fighters came onto the scene. But overall, throughout the war, its performance was basically average. What made the 190 special wasn't really performance. It was its warhorse design. A lot of these design factors are difficult to quantify and thus not often discussed. In part one, we covered its excellent flight control system, which largely used push rods and bearings for smooth, consistent performance. It featured a differential control system for the elevator and rudder to make it a bit easier to fly and improve gunnery. The 190's pitch trim was controlled via a movable stabilizer, giving greater control, or at least greater range of control, and increasing the chance of getting home with battle damage. The landing gear was stable, very rugged. Most of the subsystems, meaning weapons, landing gear, flaps, uh, stabilizer trim, and more, were electrically controlled. This meant that a loss of one system didn't affect another, unlike the hydraulic and pneumatic systems in most Allied aircraft, where a single leak from a single bullet could render multiple subsystems inoperative. We also touched a little bit on the 190's pilot-friendly cockpit design. In this episode, we'll continue talking about these types of design features, features that are not talked about much and are probably of less interest than specifications like speed and firepower, but features that contribute to the 190's effectiveness as a warplane. So let's continue our discussion with the fuselage. It's divided into two main sections, front and rear, numbered one and two here. It's made either entirely or at least largely out of Dural, which was sort of a super aluminum designed by the Germans for Zeppelin construction. Dural is so hard that some U.S. aircraft actually used thicker pieces of it for armor, specifically the F-4U Corsair and A-26 Invader. Dural armor would not stop direct fire at a 90 degree angle to the plate, at least typically it wouldn't, but it would deflect glancing blows from typical weapons at normal firing angles. This isn't to say that the 190's entire fuselage is armored. Please don't think I'm saying that. It certainly isn't. But as compared with typical softer aluminum or wood construction, I think it's likely that bullets will tend to lose more energy and deform more as they pass through the Dural skin and structure before they reach the 190's armor plate behind the cockpit. There are two more points of interest in this picture. Uh, the big cover panel at position 5 is there to get easy access to the self-sealing fuel tanks. The 190 design isn't just about making things easy for the pilot. It's designed to be easy to service. Most components that require routine servicing have large access panels and plenty of room around them to work. This matters when ground crews need to effect repairs and then get the plane rearmed, refueled, and ready for action. This ease of service, which I'll call serviceability, is a very important and rarely discussed factor in World War II air combat. If your planes have slightly superior performance, 
but because they're difficult to service, you can only get four of them into the air instead of six. That's a big drawback. Now, this was less of a factor for the U.S. Army Air Force as they tended to operate from bases farther from the front and had large numbers of personnel and supplies to keep the planes flying. Man hours required per hour of flight time are a little less important if you have a lot of men. The Germans, for much of the war, were short on everything, personnel, equipment, and parts. Serviceability was a big factor for German fighters. At position four here, we have the engine mount, which is, of course, attached to the firewall. Obviously, the firewall has to be quite strong to support the weight of the engine, as with all airplanes of similar design. Notice the notch in the fuselage under the firewall. That's where the main wing spar passes through. It's one continuous spar, and locating it under the firewall adds strength and reduces weight. I did a quick check of the usual suspects, and I did not find another European theater airplane, or any airplane, that's configured the same way, with one continuous spar that passes uh, directly underneath the firewall. So I think that's fairly unique, uh, and I checked P-47, P-51, Spitfire, Yak, and LA-5, and none of them are made, made that way. Now, if we zoom in on the front section of the fuselage, we can see the attachment points for the rear spar at position 5. It does not pass through, but doesn't need to, because in the 190, the main spar and wing skin carry the G-load. The main spar is very near the center of gravity. The rear spar acts as an attachment point for various things and helps carry the torsional or twisting loads. One more special feature before we move on to the rear fuselage. As is typical of German fighters, the pilot sits with his legs nearly straight from the seat to the rudder pedals. This helps because, well, it helps the pilot avoid blacking out during high G maneuvers because the G forces can't as easily pull blood down to the lower legs and feet. Contrast this with a Spitfire pilot who sits at a much more conventional angle, and this is typical of Allied fighters. As maximum G in both aircraft and most other World War II fighters is limited by the pilot, this gives the 190 a significant advantage in high-speed turns. At low speeds, the Spitfire will outturn the 109 no problem. However, in high-speed turns, the 190 has the edge. This is usually not reflected in simulators, which is unfortunate. And I'm talking to you, IL-2 developers. Now, in fairness, I'll say that IL-2 is a good sim. I really like it. And I do understand that the designers have to maintain some balance so that people will fly both sides in the online arenas. And in some cases, that means straying a bit from historical accuracy, but I think that's okay. Now, uh, moving on, the canopy is nice. Slides on ball bearings. That's what they're called in the manual. I think they might actually be roller bearings, but effectively the same thing in this case. So it slides on those to open and close for smooth operation. It's normally operated by a hand crank. In an emergency, the canopy can be jettisoned by an explosive charge to make it easier and faster for the pilot to bail out. It's interesting to note that in World War I, pilots were not issued parachutes, except in some cases very late in the war. The thinking was that if able to bail out, pilots would leave their planes prematurely and not finish the fight. In World War II, the Germans and most nations clearly understood that pilots are of value and saving the pilot is highly desirable. The 190 is designed with pilot survivability in mind and the jettisonable canopy is part of that equation. Without it, the pilot would have to open the canopy with the hand crank, which would take precious time. In a strange way, this also increases pilot quality. If a pilot gets shot down and successfully bails out instead of dying, it may be a learning experience resulting in a better pilot, and many of the top German aces bailed out multiple times. Let's move on to the rear fuselage. There isn't too much to talk about here. At position five, we have a fabric barrier, fabric. Actually, let's go to another picture. Okay, here it is at position eight. 
According to the factory manual, the purpose of this fabric barrier is to prevent engine exhaust from entering the cockpit. That might not make sense at first, as the engine is obviously way forward of this location and forward of the cockpit. It's not explained in the manual, but I think what's happening here is that exhaust enters the rear fuselage through the gaps at the tail wheel and rear control surfaces. The slipstream creates pressure back there that is slightly higher than that in the cockpit, so the fumes try to move forward. This barrier prevents that. Moving on, at position 8 we have the oxygen bottles. And uh, this is a little more interesting than you might think. The 190 used a series of interconnected small spherical bottles. Should a leak develop due to a component failure or battle damage, one-way valves would prevent a total loss of oxygen. This is nice because most early warfighters had only one oxygen bottle, and a hit to that bottle, or most of the associated hardware, would render the system instantly inoperative. If the battle was anywhere above about 14,000 feet, this would require the pilot to immediately descend. The 190 can take a hit to the oxygen system and stay in the fight, although for a reduced amount of time, depending on how much damage it suffered in the hit, of course. Um, with enough damage or a hit to a line downstream of the one-way valves, that'll knock the system out. But it's less likely than a plane like a P-40 Spitfire Mark V or P-47B, all of which have single bottles. Note that the P-47C models and later all have multiple bottles, uh, as do the P-51Bs, and I think the A's, and I'm sure the D's do. So the U.S. eventually went to the multiple bottle setup like the 190. Now, I don't have specific pressure numbers for the 190, but typical oxygen bottles in World War II fighters were serviced to about 400 pounds per square inch. I don't know if you've ever seen someone shoot a pressurized container. I know a lot of my, uh, my viewers on this channel are from other countries, or maybe they don't have the right to own guns. I can tell you, if you haven't seen that, you might want to watch a YouTube video on the subject. Just type in, uh, you know, 30 caliber rifle shoots oxygen bottle or something like that. You'll be surprised. It's, it's very violent. Um, if one of those bottles gets hit, it's going to be pretty exciting for the pilot. I think the idea of using a lot of small spheres, as the 190 does, will minimize the risks from a ruptured bottle. One last thing about the fuselage. As mentioned before, it has access panels and plenty of them for servicing. The access panels around the engine are strong enough for mechanics to use as a work platform. Not sure it'll support the entire weight of the mechanic, but they certainly would lie on it uh, with part of their body on it with tools and parts and stuff. And so. That's pretty handy. Let's talk about that engine. Well, not the engine itself, not yet, I, I'll get to that, but the engine control system, which was quite unique for a World War II fighter. I'll have to start this off by going over engine control systems in a typical World War II fighter. For this, I'm going to use the American P-40K, as in Kilo. The P-40 was a very common U.S. land-based fighter in 1942. It saw service in the Pacific, Africa, and on the Eastern Front with the Soviets. It was a contemporary of the earlier 109s, like the A-5 and uh, the earlier A-3. The P-40's engine controls are representative of most U.S.-based or U.S.-built fighters. The P-40 has a constant speed propeller like nearly every other World War II fighter, but I'm finding that a lot of people don't really understand what a constant speed propeller does, so we have to talk about it. In this case, it's electrically operated. Some aircraft use hydraulically operated propellers, but in principle they're the same. And in fact, some planes like the P-47 Thunderbolt could have one or the other. Some P-47s have electric props, some have hydraulic. Okay, so let's say we're flying along in our P-40. We're going to reach down and turn off the automatic prop control for this explanation. That's done via this switch and this middle position. 
Many US fighters use this exact same switch. The prop is now fixed at its current pitch, meaning just that. The blade angles will not change with the switch in this position. We need to consult two gauges, manifold pressure and RPM. In this case, manifold pressure is, let's say, 25 inches, RPM 2500. Easy numbers. I don't have gauges that move, so use your mental powers to visualize this. Now, if we reach down and push the throttle forward, power will increase. That's what the throttle is for, controlling power. That means manifold pressure will go up. Let's say we increase it from 25 up to 30 inches. What, do you, what effect do you think that will have on RPM with a fixed pitch propeller? Well, of course, RPM is going to increase. The engine is putting out more power and the prop pitch is fixed, so there's nothing to stop it from increasing. Let's say it increased from 2,500 to 2,700, and we want to get it back down. We can do that by increasing the prop pitch. That will put a greater load on the engine and slow it down a bit. Now to do that, we move our prop switch to the decrease position. This will decrease engine RPM by increasing the propeller pitch. That switch is spring-loaded to return to neutral. So we toggle it to decrease it a few times until RPM is back down to our desired value of 2500 or whatever. Easy so far, right? Let's suppose we want maximum power. This is a bit more tricky. First, we increase RPM to redline, or in this case, maybe just below. Now advance the throttle until either manifold pressure or RPM limit is reached. If you reach the RPM limit first, then you toggle the switch back to decrease and increase manifold pressure again. Keep doing this until you have 52 inches and 3,000 RPM, which is max power in this airplane. Obviously, this would be a huge pain to operate the engine this way, um, but you could do it. It's also important to understand that airspeed has a large effect here. If you have everything set just the way you want, manifold pressure and RPM is just perfect, and you enter a dive, RPM will increase. In a climb with everything fixed, when the plane slows down, RPM will decrease. Thus, if controlling the prop pitch manually, it can be a bit of a headache for anything other than cruise flight, which is why you would not normally operate your P-40 this way. The way you would normally operate it is with the switch in auto. Now the prop pitch control will be, quote, automatic, unquote. It will function as a constant speed prop, and that term will make sense in a moment. The automatic function works very well. So let's talk about it in terms of a quickie flight. RPM is set by the prop lever near the throttle when it's in auto mode, which is where you're normally going to have it. Moving that lever forward increases RPM. Moving it back um, decreases it. All the way forward is going to be redline. So let's say we're lined up on the runway, engines at idle, warmed up, everything, we're ready for takeoff, and we move the prop lever all the way forward for maximum RPM. Now the throttle's still at idle. So guess what happens when you move that prop lever forward? Well, absolutely nothing, at least not in terms of propeller RPM or engine RPM. And this is a bit confusing for people, but it's going to make sense in a moment. The reason nothing happened when you move that prop lever forward in this situation is because at idle, the engine does not have enough power to spin itself up to redline. So regardless of the prop lever position, idle the engine RPM is going to stay at the idle value. Now. As we increase power via the throttle, RPM will rise. At some point, it will reach a red line of 3,000 RPM. As power continues to increase, RPM will be held steady by the automatic constant speed prop system, which will slowly increase the propeller pitch to hold that 3,000 RPM that we've set. We keep advancing the throttle until we have 52 inches, which we can run for one minute in this airplane. Uh, gear up once we don't have enough runway in front of us to set back down. Flaps up at 500 feet. And at about 1,000 feet, we'll pull the power back to recommended climb power. In this case, uh, we're going to use 35 inches and uh, 2,500 RPM. Now, it's important to pull the throttle back first. Be aware that after pulling the RPM back, it will typically cause manifold pressure to rise a little bit, so you may have to readjust the throttle. 
So once we level off and accelerate, we pull it back to cruise power again. Throttle first, then prop. Can't stress that enough. At this point, we'll also put the mixture to auto lean and probably close up the cowl flaps. Now let's touch on that mixture control for a minute. I'm not going to go into this too far, just far enough to understand the control usage. Most US fighters have this same setup. Four positions for the mixture control. All the way back is idle cutoff. This is used to shut off the engine. Just forward is auto lean. In this position, the system will automatically adjust the mixture for best economy. Forward of that is auto rich. This is used for takeoff, landing, or any time when maximum power is or may be needed, like in a dogfight. Forward of that is full rich. This is only used when the auto rich system is malfunctioning. For our purposes right now, you can forget about full rich. In fact, uh, some later American airplanes don't even have it. Now, we're in cruise at 8,000 feet in our scenario, and we see a plane we need to catch up to. Could be friend, could be foe. Thus, we need more power. So to increase power, we need to move all three of these levers. First, the mixture to auto rich. Failure to do this could result in engine knock, which could damage the engine, so don't forget. Next, prop lever full forward to 3000. You can't just slam it forward because if you do, the RPM can react too fast for the governor and cause it to over rev. So move it forward a bit slowly. You don't have to be crazy slow, but maybe take a full second or two to get it all the way forward. Now, move the throttle forward for maximum manifold pressure. A word of caution here, if we were in a P-40 variant um, prior to the K model, we would not be able to just go full forward on the throttle. Uh, the K models and later have a manifold pressure regulator, so full forward equals full allowable pressure. In the earlier models, the pilot has to watch the manifold pressure gauge and stop when the desired value of 52 inches is reached. Now at this point, we may want to open up the cowl flaps a bit if in a climb. If you're getting at the idea that there's a lot involved in engine management, well, yes, there is, and this is in a late model P-40, which is sort of a best case example for an Allied fighter. So when bounced and you need to go to full power, it's mixture auto rich, prop full forward, then throttle, possibly then cowl flaps if coolant temperature requires it. Doing these things in the wrong order, for example, if you go throttle prop mixture, is a quick way to damage or destroy the motor. And remember, pulling it back, it's the opposite. Pulling it back, it's throttle first, then prop, then mixture. Now, why not just leave the prop lever all the way forward all the time? That's because settings with lower RPM are desirable for cruise flight and uh, for also for climbs that are going to take place over a long period of time. Fuel economy and engine life are increased at some lower RPM, and noise is reduced. So in cruise, we would pull the RPM back to 2300 or whatever we need, and the automatic propeller control, the constant speed, constant speed prop system, will hold that RPM, provided, of course, we have enough manifold pressure to maintain it. If we pull the throttle back past a certain point, RPM will, of course, decrease because no changes in blade angle would be able to affect it. Just think about that. As you're pulling the throttle back more and more, the propeller is going to a flatter and flatter pitch in order to try and maintain engine RPM. And once it gets as flat as it's going to go, or as low pitch as possible, is another way to say it, uh, it can't go any lower, so any further reduction in throttle will slow the engine down. Uh, that's also why moving it forward when we were at idle didn't speed it up. Now, uh, in a dogfight, Although this may have all sound, sounded fairly complicated, but in a dogfight, it's really no big deal. Once the mixture is in auto rich and the prop lever is full forward, all the pilot really needs to do is worry about the throttle. Now, that's in a P-40 or typical U.S. fighter, uh, or a later war British fighter. Now, in some other planes, though, it's quite a bit worse. For example, in a Yak-1, there's no automatic mixture control. You have to set it manually. That means in order to get maximum power from the engine, the pilot will have to carefully adjust the mixture. It's not just a question of moving it to a preset position. And the optimal setting will change with changes in altitude or atmospheric conditions, uh, temperature, uh, humidity, and whatnot. Furthermore, in the yak, the mixture control is on the right-hand side, meaning the pilot will have to take his hand off the stick to uh, manipulate it. And 
I think this is one of the reasons that you see pilot reports. Um, a good example is the 109E versus uh, the early Spitfires, the Battle of Britain era stuff. Uh, by the numbers, the Spitfire was a faster airplane at the altitudes at which those planes fought, and yet there are many, many pilot reports saying that the 109s were faster. And I think a part of that is the fact that the Spitfire's top speed is with the mixture adjusted perfectly, and that's not always something pilots were able to do in the realities of combat. All right, now let's uh, talk about the FW-190, now that you understand how a constant speed prop works and what's involved in managing the engine. In the 190, when ready for takeoff, you push the throttle lever all the way forward. That's about it. In typical variants, and we'll cover specifics later, but generally this will give you 1.42 atta. That's uh, 1.42 times the standard atmosphere. Uh, 2700 RPM and a fuel-air mixture ideal for power. When you want to pull the power back to climb, pull the throttle lever back until you have 1.32 atta and the prop governor will automatically give you 2400 RPM. Alternatively, you could just watch the tack, pull it back to 2400 RPM and you should have about 1.32 atta. For cruise, pull back to 1.2 atta, RPM will automatically go to 2300 and mixture will lean out for max economy. Thus, most engine management functions are handled automatically in the 190. All the pilot needs to do is move the throttle back and forth as needed for power. Specifically, these functions are handled by a system called Commando Garrett, and who knows if I'm saying that correctly, which regulates boost pressure, engine RPM, fuel mixture, ignition timing, and supercharger speed switching. That word means command unit. Uh, thus, the 190's, the 190 pilot's workload is greatly reduced. Now, in mid and later 190's, like uh, the A5 model and later, the pilot does have to manage the cowl flaps, but these don't require much work and can be left fully closed in most in-flight conditions. More on that when we cover the engine and cowling. So, how does this automated system work? Well, I'm afraid I, I don't know a whole lot on this. Uh, I can say that it's a hydro-mechanical computer, very heavy on the mechanical side. We can deduce certain things. The primary inputs are throttle lever position, throttle lever position, I'm sorry, and manifold pressure. I believe it runs uh, maps for fuel mixture, RPM, and ignition timing, and supercharger switching, based entirely on those two inputs. I could not find any sign of inputs for anything other than those two things. Of course, we know what the outputs are. Again, they're manifold pressure, RPM, ignition timing, fuel mixture, and supercharger switching. Here is the inside of this thing. As you can see, it is largely a mechanical computer made up of gears, springs, cams, levers, and push rods. The control unit makes the 190 a lot easier to operate throughout the flight envelope from takeoff to landing. Uh, in a dogfight, its advantage isn't huge against, say, a P-40 because once the P-40 pilot has everything set, as we talked about, he only needs to manipulate the throttle. Uh, against a typical Soviet plane or an early Spitfire, it's a bigger advantage because they can't get maximum performance without careful adjustment. And even then, the changes to the adjustments have to be made constantly as altitude changes. The 190 and P40 both, both do that, the mixture control, uh, automatically. So, if the 190 system is so great, this command unit, why didn't everyone use it? I mean, even other German fighters weren't using it. The 109 didn't use it. It did have automatic mixture, but not, uh, not the prop and so forth. There are several reasons. First, the jet engine made piston engine fighters obsolete and the jet only has one main lever, a thrust lever. It doesn't have a mixture control or prop control or cowl flaps for that matter. A quick note, there are, somebody will mention this I'm sure, there are some Rolls-Royce jets and a few others that have a mixture control but those are only used for starting uh, in cold temperatures. Uh, once the engine's running you don't mess with it. So the issue of a fighter plane's complicated engine operation sort of solved itself with the introduction of jets. Now, in the case of large transports and bombers, 
they were operated in a very different way from fighters, and they just didn't have much to gain from this kind of a system. Most of these planes had two pilots, and very often a flight engineer to help with engine management. As you can see here, a B-36 flight engineer had a massive amount of engine management stuff to deal with, as well as fuel system and pressurization and other things. But he didn't have to fly the plane at the same time. Uh, that's a significant uh, difference from a fighter plane. The uh, Commando Garrett system, or command unit, does have some drawbacks. First, it's obviously complex and probably expensive. However, I do think it was quite reliable. A little hard to gauge that, but I haven't read about a lot of problems with it. In uh, one U.S. test, which I can't find at the moment, unfortunately, but it was uh, mentioned that the command unit might make formation flying a little less, a little more difficult due to variations in setup. In other words, if all the planes are set to 2300 RPM, they may all vary slightly in manifold pressure, or if set by manifold pressure, they may vary slightly in engine RPM. I can't really see that being an issue, as no two planes are identical anyway, and when in formation, you use the power setting you need to stay with your leader. You don't just set 1.3 ATA and you know, hope, you, hope you stay in formation. So uh, another thing, though, is it's, it's possible that long-range crews will suffer at certain altitudes. For example, the A8 manual puts long-range crews at 1.1 ATA and 2100 RPM. There may be some altitudes at which you would be better off with 1.0 and 2150 or 1.15 and 2000. But these settings are not available because engine RPM and manifold pressure cannot be adjusted independently. Well, at least not without going to manual prop control. In short, I don't really think there are any meaningful drawbacks. It's just that the system was ahead of its time, and then the jet engine showed up. Pilot reports on the Commando Garrett seem positive. Uh, there does seem to be a small minority that felt it was more trouble than it's worth, but I haven't read anything uh, from a German pilot that really expanded on that. What was it they didn't like about it? I just haven't seen much on that. It's my opinion that overall this was a good thing and also that its value increased as pilot experience decreased, which was certainly the situation in Germany for the last two years or so of the war. Now I mentioned manual prop control for the 190. As with the P-40, the 190's prop can be controlled manually. It's done via an electric switch on the throttle. So even the manual control is more user-friendly than others because of the switch location. Let's talk about it. Below the throttle is a toggle switch. It's normally forward, which gives you automatic propeller control. However, if your command unit fails, you can move this switch aft and put the prop into manual control at this point. A thumb-activated rocker switch on the throttle will increase or decrease engine RPM by changing propeller pitch, exactly as we described with the P-40. It's just that the switch is easier to use since the pilot's hand is already there. Let's go into the cockpit for a little bit. I'm not going to go over every switch here just yet. Over the entire series here we're doing, we will probably cover every everything in here in more detail than you want. But for right now, I'm only going to go over the stuff we've talked about so far. This particular plane is the Smithsonian's F-8 model. I would have preferred a picture of an A-3, A-5, or A-8, but this is what we have, and, it's, and it will do. At some point in the series, I will cover the F-8, which is a ground attack variant. Let me add in a circle. This is the throttle, and it's where we're going first. The red arrow points to the stabilizer trim switch and position indicator. The blue circles are the landing gear buttons. Note that the button for retraction has a guard to prevent accidental activation. The green arrow points to the flat position selection buttons. In this picture, the throttle itself is in an intermediate position. You can see that the pilot doesn't have to move his hand far to manipulate these controls. In fact, if the throttle was a bit farther back, the pilot could probably select flaps without even taking his hand off the throttle. Also, take a, notice that there's a metal ridge in between the flap and landing gear buttons. That helps so that the pilot can hit the correct button without looking down at it. He knows that the flap ones are on the left side of that ridge, so he can do that entirely by feel. 
Now this whole setup seems like it would be a logical way to do things, but it was not common in World War II airplanes. I'm not sure ergonomics was a term that existed back then. I guess I should have looked this up before I recorded this. Uh, but in any case, the 190's cockpit is very ergonomic, even by modern standards. In most other fighters of the era, controls were located just seemingly wherever the designer wanted to put them without regard for pilot convenience. Some were better than others, but the 190 was the best of all. Let's move forward a bit here. This arrow is pointing to the rocker switch used for manual prop control we discussed a few moments ago. No need to hunt for that switch, it's right there. So, if the automatic prop controls fail, all the pilot has to do is put it into manual with the switch under the throttle, can't really see it here, and then use the rocker switch while watching the tachometer. Easier said than done, but at least with your hand on the throttle, you can more easily avoid engine damage while moving the prop. I'm not sure any of this is modeled in current sims, but if uh, you're changing prop pitch to lower RPM, just be careful not to spike the manifold pressure. If it starts to rise, pull the throttle back. When increasing, don't overspeed the engine. If it's starting to overspeed, pull the throttle back. Uh, and then go to decrease on the switch. It's much easier in this airplane than in airplanes where that switch is located in a spot where you can't have your hand on the throttle as you manipulate it. So, now I know that in the current version of IL-2, there is no case where the automatic prop control fails, not due to damage or anything else. So, Probably most people aren't too worried about this. Not sure about DCS. I haven't flown that yet. Fully intend to. Notice the red circle showing the empty spot in the panel. This was where the identify friend or foe or IFF control was located. Why is it missing from this otherwise very complete airplane? Well, the IFF system had a self-destruct function, and they were pretty serious about it. A cursory glance at the plane's electrical system shows that the designers wanted to make sure that the self-destruct system would have power when needed. I don't know if it self-destructed via an explosive charge or if it started itself on fire, but either way, I can see why a museum might want, might want to remove this. Of course, it's also possible it was removed before the plane was captured. I'm going to learn more about this IFF system, and uh, I'll talk about it more, including the self-destruct feature, in a future episode. Interestingly, there is nothing about the system in the aircraft manuals. They're in some other manual that I, I haven't found yet. Uh, notice the straps on the rudder pedals. I haven't seen a single reference to these in print, but I think the obvious purpose is to allow either foot to move the rudder in either direction. So if for example, your right foot is uh, is you know injured some for some reason, probably bullets. Um, your left foot would be able to move the rudder either direction. Now let's move over to the other side of the cockpit. These switches are combination circuit breakers and switches. I really like these. I need to mention that there are a lot more of these in the A5 and the A8. This is the A8 here. I don't know where they all went in the F8. I'll have to try and figure that out for a later episode. I will cover the A8 at some point, but it wasn't, uh, it's not the focus of, of uh, my efforts at this moment. But anyhow, it's what we have. So back to our F8 picture. These particular circuit breakers are for fuel pumps. What I'm trying to point out here is that the breakers will be very easy for the pilot to find if needed. First of all, they're all located so they can be seen. Second, since they're combination breakers and switches, the pilot will know where they are because he uses them essentially every time he flies. In a typical fighter, the circuit breakers are used uh, only in some sort of abnormal situation or emergency, and then it's usually a hunt to find them. Here circled in red is the P-47 Thunderbolts circuit breaker panel. They're located down by the pilot's left calf. Oh, and I also circled that manual prop control. It's there in blue, since we were talking about that earlier. So you can understand that manual prop control in the Thunderbolt or a P-40 or really any U.S. airplane, you can't move the, you can't change the propeller pitch with your hand on the throttle. Now, uh, this configuration regarding the circuit breakers is very typical for a U.S. fighter, although sometimes, as with the F-6F Hellcat and the P-51 Mustang, 
The breakers are on the other side. They're by the pilot's right cap instead. Now I can tell you from personal experience that when you are in a single pilot airplane flying in the clouds, so you have to keep an eye on the gauges just to stay upright, and you have to find a circuit breaker, it is not fun. And typically this happens because something didn't work and you have to find and cycle the breaker, meaning pull it and reset it, which often fixes it. Or sometimes if it popped, you're going to push it back in. That's a whole discussion I don't want to get into right now because it, it can be a really, really bad idea to reset a pop breaker. Um, in any case, having to find the breaker in a warplane could be a big deal. Just imagine you're heading into combat and your drop tank won't release. Well, one of the things you're going to need to do to try and get it to release is find and recycle that circuit breaker. So um, it's really nice if you know where all this stuff is. In the 190, finding the breaker just won't be a problem. I should also mention that nearly everything in the 190 has its own circuit breaker. So a short in any given component won't take out other components. Uh, there are some U.S. airplanes where you lose uh, part of your electrical system and it takes out all kinds of stuff. Kurt Tank was really putting his electrical engineering background to work on this project. I, I hope to uh, go over the electrical system at some point in this series because it's, it's really pretty nice. Now that's all I have for this episode. Two episodes down and I haven't even started on the stuff we normally cover like engines and aerodynamics. In the case of the 190, there is just a lot to talk about on those subjects, not to mention performance, armor, and so on, but I really felt we had to get started with these things that make the 190 um, a little unusual. I want to take a moment to thank all my Patreons. Their support is very appreciated, and it's helping me get this series out a bit faster than normal. I also want to thank Bjorn Huber. I don't know him. Uh, but he is the guy that made these drawings and furthermore made them available on Wikimedia Commons for all to use uh, at no charge. That's really wonderful of that person to do. And uh, these drawings are just beautiful. And I know you can't see it here because of the way YouTube resolution and stuff works. But if you uh, go to Wikimedia Commons and get one of those images and zoom all the way in, you can actually see every single rivet. They're, they're that detailed. Uh, moving on, I want to mention Bismarck recently, like within the last week, uh, put up a short video walk around of a 190A8 in Germany. You may have seen it. I'll put a link in the description. I suggest uh, watching it, or if you've already seen it, watch it again because you will see different things after watching this video. For example, in his video you can clearly see how nicely the main wing spar tucks in underneath the firewall. I was never really able to appreciate how nicely that was done until I saw it up close and in color. And there really isn't anywhere on the internet you can see that that well. He, uh, fortunately, with what is, he apparently had very limited time with this airplane, and he zeroed right in on the stuff that you can't normally see. So uh, I'm very appreciative of that. Anyhow, uh, you can also see other things like how much room the designers left at the back of the engine for mechanics to reach in and service things. Although this is an A8, an A3 would probably have a little bit less room in the fore aft dimension. Um, as he walks around, notice the trim tabs we talked about and uh, in the previous episode, and take a look at the oxygen bottles. You can see them really well. Uh, we did not coordinate on this. We don't know each other. Uh, he just happened to put up a video that showed some of the things I talked about. It's nice when things work out like that. That's all I have for now. I uh, hope to see you all on uh, the next episode. Have a great day.